Well, let's talk for a moment, Jeff, about galvanic isolators, because for decades, there was one brand that basically dominated marketplace. And um, they those galvanic isolators, if you've got a boat that's a, I'm not sure what point this really changed, but 20 years older, 20 years or older, and it has a galvanic isolator on it, it's likely to have one of those isolators on it, which which are potentially going to fail safe or may not be working anyway. It might have been decades ago that they actually failed, and, and there's no way of knowing that. Uh, back, back in the um, early 2000s, the ABYC toughened up its galvanic isolator standard to require essentially a fail-safe circuit. Um, so that, for example, if the, the boat gets hit by lightning, the, galva- the isolator will fail in the closed position. But at that point, you've no longer got galvanic protection on the boat. Uh, but at least you've got the the safety ground back to shore uh, because it's failed in the closed position. Um, and so either way, with any galvanic isolator on the boat, you, you do want to periodically test it to make sure that it's still working and it's doing its job. And um, I don't know anybody that does that on a regular basis, but you, you really should because it's if it's a newer one, it may have failed closed, and then it's not providing galvanic protection. And if it's an older one, it may have failed, op- failed open, in which case it's not providing the essential safety protection. Okay. Um, another question here, Nigel, uh, that we didn't go into that I'd like to for you maybe to ex- uh, talk about is how do we go about or how does a boater uh, go about testing a galvanic isolator to make sure that it has not failed either open or closed, depending on the model they have? And why is that so important? Um, on testing your galvanic isolator. Well, <laughs> I have a couple of pages on this in my boat owner's Same mechanical here. and electrical manual. And I think uh, maybe uh, you'd need to get a copy of all of that and, and go to the library or, <laughs> and take a look at that. Uh, it, it's not hard to do, but there's a there's a number of steps there that you need with a multimeter. That I don't think that um, works too well describing it just verbally without some illustrations. Yeah, there's some to-dos uh, for the boaters out that are curious. Uh, you need a multimeter. You need to have a diode testing. Uh, the mm-hmm. direction on which you test is important. Um, and to a little bit echo what Nigel said, um, prior older models of uh, galvanic isolators used to fail open, which is the worst part. You lose your shore power connection on the grounding connector. Uh, that is losing the shoulder on a road. Um, it's, it's like those narrow bridges that you can't pull out on. I mean, you can, this categorical, you cannot lose your grounding connection on an AC shore power connection. You just can't. And it does happen because Galvan guy slayers do fail. And in the past when they failed, they weren't fail safe. They would fail open, which is just terrible. So it is part of the routine to test those. Uh, the manufacturer's manual is going to say so. So um, it's something that everyone should add on their list. And that, like Nigel said, there's a bunch of videos on how to go about testing a galvanic isolator with a multimeter uh, and make sure your multimeter has a diode testing mode. And you have to do it within one way, not the other. So that would be a wrap up. Do you want to well, add I anything else on that's that? A really useful point to make here, Jeff, is that a decent multimeter is the prerequisite and that, to oh, my yeah. mind, is the single most useful tool on a boat. When, when I go visit other people, I always take a multimeter with me. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, knowing how to use it. But the other piece of kit, while I'm thinking about this, which um, almost nobody has on the boat, is a meter lead extender. Uh, you can buy them for less than $20. Um, it's a mm. spool about this size, and you can pull the leads out and and they come out either way, and they'll stretch up to 30 feet. And then um, you can and plug it into your multimeter, and then you can connect one end of that, say, at the battery, if you're looking to see if there's a break in a circuit somewhere. And then you can take your meter all over the boat. Uh, for, for a basic, s- simple troubleshooting processes, a long meter lead like that, and a meter in its faults mode, you can track down pretty much any fault on a boat. Uh, and, and the benefit of being in the faults mode, if you're not an experienced meter user, is that it's almost impossible to hurt yourself, the boat, or the meter in the faults mode. And you can get into trouble in some of the other modes. Um, so I, I think 
the, the key here is to get a decent multimeter and you need to expect to expend at, at least $100. And, oh. uh, and to make sure it's got the basic volts, amps, resistance, and a diode tester, which you just mentioned, which many of them don't. And then yeah. uh, to get that extent meter lead extension and then uh, get some practice using the meter uh, so you know how to use it when you need it. And we have a uh, quite a bit of information in our boat how-to course. We have a troubleshooting seminar on and a video on on using a meter for troubleshooting. But but it, once you get the hang of it, it's a superb troubleshooting tool. Yeah, and especially the ones that are DC clamp-on, AC and DC clamp-on are huge to be able yes. to measure current current yeah. uh, without disconnecting a conductor or putting it into series just through magnetic flux is a huge advantage. And I would say to echo what Nigel is saying, even if you don't know how to use it, just the fact that you have one on board is going to allow someone else uh, to use it. So it could be that someone else could, you know, we help boaters sometimes over the phone to troubleshoot shoot with a multimeter. Uh, you might have a friend or someone in the marina or in the anchorage that knows how to use it. Without the tool, you're it's it's hopeless. You need that tool to be able to isolate and figure out a lot of common nuisance type of electrical problems, like changing a fuse, uh, knowing that it's actually, um, you know, that it's now you don't have a circuit. All those little things can be done with a, a DC multimeter, AC and DC multimeter, and hopefully a clamp on. It's highly recommended, highly, highly recommended to be resourceful on the water. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, it's worth also pointing out that the vast majority of those clamp-in meters read AC amps and not DC. And uh, we, we re very rarely need to measure AC amps on a boat. What we want is a DC clamp meter. If it, will, if it reads correct. DC, it will also read AC. But it, if it correct. reads AC, it doesn't mean it'll read DC. So we need to make sure it's a DC clamp meter. Yeah, that's why I did that when I bought my boat in 2006. Went to Home Depot, bought a clamp-on meter. So happy. And I've kept it as a reminder because it's an AC only clamp on meter. So if you're curious again, go on our website and find out more answers and solutions with this sort of setup. And thanks for asking. And thanks for all of you for listening and tuning in.